Hey, this is Meredith Elliott Powell. And you know what time it is? It is one o'clock Eastern. It is time to learn the strategies you need to thrive in uncertainty. We're going to talk about a very important subject. In fact, I was really focused a lot on this this morning with uh, two of my clients, the importance and the power of communication and where this artist's background, who is our guest, where her whole background fits into this. So today I have with me Hillary Blair. You just hold on. We're going to pop this video and start this session. Whoops. Again, this is Meredith Elliott Powell, and welcome to Thrive, the show where we discuss the strategies you need to turn uncertainty into your greatest competitive advantage. And I am really excited today to have a powerhouse with me, Hillary Blair. Welcome to the show, Hillary. Uh, thrilled to be here. Yes, you're the powerhouse. I'm excited to learn from you. Well, I love the fact that, you know, sitting right behind you all in glow is art. And I want to begin this show by really helping the audience understand that you have a theatrical background. You're an artist by nature. Yes. But you've turned this into a business around communication, connection, and the importance of presence. So give us a little bit of background about how that came about. As an actor and a teaching artist, so an actor who has been teaching all ages for many, many years, I was your typical theater artist who had this large chip on my shoulder about business. Mm. They are money grubbing thieves, just, you know, bad, <laughs> bad, bad, right? <laughs> and I came out of grad school for, for theater. It's a degree that makes your parents super secure, you know, MFA, <laughs> Master of Fine Arts and Acting. And I was doing one of my children's shows. I love theater for youth. An amazing three-hander, that means three actors, three characters. It's called Tomato Plant Girl. Mm -hmm. And it had Bossy Best Friend, Little Girl, and Tomato Plant Girl. I was Tomato Plant Girl. An amazing <laughs> show about friendship and bullying and all of that. And... I'm in the show and I'm a little tomato that grows into a bigger tomato and we learn about friendship. And at the end of the show, I am out in the lobby, shaking, leaning down and shaking little hands as they go by, right? And that's typical, like, hi, and greeting everyone. And then these legs come in front of me and I hear an adult voice ask, do you work with business people? <laughs> in my head, I'm thinking, I'm a tomato. Like I am a large <laughs> tomato right now that just ate dirt on stage in the form of Oreos. Yes. Uh, and out loud, I said, some? And she leaned down and she tucked her business card into my tomato costume and said, call me when you've worked with more. Interesting. And I'm thinking, right? I'm like, what is this? So I get the card. I go back to the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, so the theater company where I'm teaching and working and business people started calling, of course, right? Because a visionary saw me. And when they said, do you work with business people? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> and I started working with business people on their communication. As a performing artist who's been working with little kids all the way to adults in the performing arts and doing arts integration, yet in the arts world for many, many years, I started saying, yes, I learned some lessons quickly. Meredith, if you come to me, I don't have you lay on the ground to work on your breathing, okay? So that is, I learned that pretty quickly. It took me a moment, but I did learn like, oh, they don't like that. So I learned to do some, because that's what you do with actors. Right. Five months pass, I have done great work with business people. I call this woman and I say, hey, five months, I've been working with business people. She said, great, hop on a plane, come to New York. We have a program. It's called Count Me In for Women's Economic Independence. And the program we're doing is Make Mine a Million. I want you to come and I want you to coach the entrepreneurs on their pitches. And I want to see how you do. What is an actor here? Oh, I have an audition in New York. So I hop on an airplane, I fly to New York. And from that moment forth, my whole life changed because I learned about business people and about what they need and how I 
could bring my understanding of embodiment and presence and voice to their understanding of their passion for delivering a service or a product. You all know the woman who saw me as the woman who co-founded Take Our Daughters to Work Day. Her wow. name is Nell Merlino. She is a visionary who saw a tomato and said, <laughs> you should be working with business people. <laughs> and I tell that story because I would not have found it on my own in that way because I had that chip on my shoulder. So understanding that I was the one who needed to learn about what the business world had to offer. I fell in love with business people and understood that I had so much to figure out and I committed to creating a business in a way that I could offer jobs to fellow artists to share our understanding of how we show up in the world. It has been a journey, Meredith, for sure. They don't there is a sense, not for everyone, but there is a sense in the artist world that the starving artist, that that archetype, that 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 vision that we have can really blind us to possibility because we get hung up in that. And for me to start recognizing that business people have the same passion and the same drive, mm -hmm. what I was missing was that business folks track and measure. And when you start to recognize that true artists who are really trying to make things happen, they do track and measure. Yeah. And Seinfeld, famous one, he would track his jokes that he told and figure out how they landed on people. And he wrote a joke a day and he tracked, okay, then I, then I fell down. I didn't write one that way day, but he tracked and he tracked and measured comedy and his business and all of that. So now 10 years, fast forward, through many, many lessons, we have come to understand that embodiment, which means being in your body, being fully voice and present with other people is about relationship. And that is what we have found that our corporate and business owners are craving, that we come with tools and ideas of how to activate that, make it happen, connect, be aware of what's missing if it's not happening. We put you know, the I back in team, Meredith. Well, you know what I love and why I was so excited to talk to you is that, um, is that first of all, I think communication is one of the most un misunderstood words. Yeah. It's probably overused and misunderstood. But the moment that uncertainty hit, you know, whether it's COVID, whether it's what we're going through now, yep. com communication is a leader's most important tool. So when you think about here, you come from the acting world where you've got to get on stage or, you know, or camera and you've got to relay a message and get the audience engaged and get them to feel like they're a part of that. Where were the disconnects you felt once you saw business? Where did you feel that those disconnects were? For us, the biggest one, I believe, is the under the misunderstanding, we'll go back to that, yeah. that communication is about me sharing the message to you mm. versus with you. And when we go to this virtual world, when we go to video, it can become even more so because we can no longer feel each other. We rely fully on the visual and that can give us misguided information. It can give us limited information. So the Biggest thing was, how do I still remain in relationship? How do I connect with you, Meredith, through the waves, through this glass wall, through all of this? And it has to do with a sense of availability, vulnerability, openness to question what I'm doing and how I'm showing up. And what we say is we need to be self-aware, not self-conscious. Self-conscious makes us a, put a wall between each other. Like if I'm self-conscious, am I really connecting with you? I'm on video. How do I look? What's happening? Is my hair okay? All the things that make us self-conscious, we disconnect. When we are self-aware, how do we remain in relationship? We got called by a company that we had done a lot of work for right at the beginning of the pandemic. We had a leader who was quite visionary who said, I need you to train my 300 top leaders around the, around the world, and I need you to connect with them on how they're showing up on video because they haven't done it. 
this is what we worked on. And the other thing, Meredith, are the little tiny things. So the little things where they would, they would tip their head. They would do, they would connect on something more intense by just a little tip of their head. Or they'd, what we say is go off voice. So they'd push more air through. I am connected to you and I want you to feel that. And I care, I care a great deal. Those elements were the, were like the poker tells, we call them the poker tells, that they weren't connected. So relationship, the things that we think make us connect when actually what connects is being fully open, vulnerable, available, and figuring out, hey, how did that land? Being curious with each other. How did that land? Did that land? I don't think that connected. Did that connect? Did that, yeah, that kind of thing. How does, how does a leader know if they're... Yeah if they're connecting. I mean, how do they know if it's, if it's registering? And I've kind of become really fascinated with this because it's, um, and y- you've got to be this way, but I watch leaders and I think, wow, yeah. that message is so good, but it is not landing at all. Yes. And it is nothing to do with the words they're saying. Right. I don't, I don't know I'm about to say so. I, and I don't mean to be tooting a, any coach's horns or anything, but the, I don't think sometimes we take enough time to watch what we're doing or to get the feedback. Mm-hmm. And we have to get feedback from someone who is not on our payroll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because <laughs> someone on our payroll is, you are great. You're amazing. Like they don't even mean to, but they are going to be in that arena, right? That That sense of like, yeah, you're great. And so you have to get really that that outside view, I'm thinking of the, all these leaders that I was working with. So many of them often say, no one has ever said that to me. And I said, of course yeah. not. <laughs> Who's right. going to risk their job <laughs> by telling you that that made no sense, or I don't feel connected to you. I think also there's a misunderstanding about what it means to be connected. And we get hung up on charisma. So mm. charisma is super important, but charisma is what we call hanging out at the third pillar of presence, not the fourth pillar. And there's an idea of I'm I'm seeing you, I'm allowing you to see me, I'm choosing how I'm showing up. But that fourth, that's where charisma hangs out. So I'm on stage, I'm on the video, I'm connected here. But the one that I'm not really allowing to happen is I'm receiving you seeing me. I'm in relationship with you. So on the platform, when you're speaking, when you're in a meeting, when you are leading a team, a group meeting versus a one-on-one, all of that, are you allowing yourself to be seen? One of my colleagues, Courtney, put it a great way. She was like, you can invite people over to dinner, but when do you sit down and eat with them? Mm -hmm. So that's where we feel that people miss out. They don't sit down and have the meal, that vulnerability and get food stuck in their teeth and have that idea, right? It's like being real with each other. And when we have a leader who is saying, wait a minute, I need feedback. How am I coming across? What's happening with my voice? Am I connected or am I disconnected? Am I, are the words I'm using, are they working? Words and how they land are shifting constantly. And if we are not questioning the language that we're using, the phrases that we're using, if we're not questioning that they still work, we are missing great opportunity. And in my world, executive, we don't use executive presence anymore. Oh, interesting. Right? We use leadership presence or personal presence or presence. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you keep up with the words that are shifting? Are you just paying attention to what people are doing? How does one tune into that? Lots of reading, lots of paying attention and asking on all of our sessions, let me know what language isn't landing. And you have to be careful, right? Because we're in a time when people truly, (laughs) uh, we're sticking up for ourselves in so many ways that sometimes we can get hung up on a word that then we can go down a rabbit hole about it versus saying, okay, is it, do we need to do that? Do we need to just toss that word out? Do we need to simply shift? Asking, being open, all ages. We need to be in the whole realm of diversity, open to, oh, interesting. I didn't know that word landed that way. And thank you. We have to be careful of not being defensive. It's really easy as a human being to go defensive before curious. You know, I think um, I want to, I have a million questions I want to ask you, you, but but I want to, um, I want to, in Derek's point here, because he's talking about if you're in over communication, 
listening more. I want to, yeah. I want to ask you about listening and mm-hmm. where listening comes in to communication and, um, and connection. I also want to understand, I want to, after we visit that, I want to go back a little bit more to your artist side and making yep. a bit of that transition. Because I think to me, I know when I entered the business world, I do not have an artist background, but, but I always felt that the business world was too black and white. We were too worried about dotting the I's and crossing the, the T's that if you could get some of the gray in there to me, which is the artistic bend of it, that is when I've always said, when it comes to sales, a great sales pe- person understands the science and the art of it. And just like you said, with art, we need to learn to track and measure. We need to take some of those things that the business side has absolutely. And the business side needs that um that artistic side but i'm getting way ahead of myself Great. let's go Listen. back to let's yeah. go back to listening because where does again a word that we throw out constantly but i don't think yes. we really get the the power of it and where does that fit in everything that you're talking about and it's interesting for me about listening i've been i've been jumping on a number of webinars to talk to hear folks talking about it more in as an as a performing artist Listening and being in the moment with our scene partners, with the others on stage is a huge part of our training and really being present because we don't know where they're going to go, what we're going to hear, if it's going to come out correctly each time. And that listening part is part of dialogue. I think that our focus on listening recently, and I don't know if it's probably, you know, the people who've been teaching listening are like, it isn't recent. We've been working on it for decades. (laughs) Is that the concept that that idea of being in relationship, we have to have that space for the other. And and I don't always know, it doesn't always mean going silent. Okay. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, listening doesn't have to be silent. Listening has to be open and open to influence. And we all listen slightly differently, right? We have, just as we have different styles of communication, we have different styles of listening. And if we are curious and truly ask curious questions and want to hear, then we're in the mode to listen. It is really easy to tell and to say, especially in the interest of time, in the interest that we think we know better, in the interest of taking care of others, put a Band-Aid on that, fix this, versus saying, hey, what's going on? What's happening? And the other thing is we ask questions like I just did, which are, vague in general versus specific. In good listening, we ask specific questions. The specificity of questions is connected, we believe, directly to strong listening and opening up to what's happening. The problem is that as with being specific with questions and really designing time to listen, you have to do it intentionally. Yeah. And there's not always time. We feel like there's not always time to be intentional. So yeah. those are all woven together. Does that help with some of yeah, that? that- it, it does. And I think it's, you know, when I started studying uncertainty, it became so important because it's once the moment the business environment is uncertain, people feel out of control. And mm-hmm. the one thing that we can give them is a voice. When I get to share an idea yeah. or an opinion, all of a sudden, I feel some level, I almost calm down. I mean, for Mm. you to tell me something is a completely different feeling than you to ask me something. And, um, and I think that that, but, but the points that you're making so much and you have to be intentional. I mean, you really, people can tell if you don't want, if you're, if you're just being, you know, if you're just like, you know, dotting an I or crossing a T, you're not really doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I was, yes, uh, so much so. So many, uh, like five thoughts just collided in my head when you said that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the other thing I want to go back to, because I want to make sure that the audience um, doesn't miss, God, there's so much good information um, in that you're sharing with us. But this last piece about, you said, you know, is it is it your fourth pillar where you have to be in relationship? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. It's, um, I asked a good friend of ours, Linda Larson, to watch a video of mine. Yeah. And it was actually a video speaking engagement where I had gotten a standing ovation. So I thought I was the bomb, right? Yep. But, but she came back and she pointed out six places where I had done something 
and the audience wanted to play with me, but I didn't let them in. And it was, I would have never, if I'd never asked for the feedback, I never would have seen it. And if I hadn't watched it through her eyes, it, that is a really powerful pillar. I mean, I really shut the wall, close them out. And, and to bust that fourth one, I think that's another level for an executive. I mean, you've got to think that it's your fourth pillar, correct? Yeah. And I, that is what a gift from, yeah, what a gift from her to see that. And that is, that is the problem for uh, us as speakers, us as leaders. They, you did get a great response because you did a great job. Yeah. And sometimes what we say is, do you want people leaving a meeting, a speaking engagement going, that was an amazing speaker. Meredith Elipot was amazing. Or do you want them going out thinking about themselves? Yeah. And so we can get caught up as leaders that that idea is it should be, I want them thinking I'm a great leader. I'm good. I'm a good speaker. I'm a good whatever. What Linda Larson gave you was the gift of Yes, Meredith, but what they wanted was they wanted to be in relationship with you. So yeah. they do we want people leaving our meetings, our conversations with more introspection about themselves and leaving with questions and leaving, yeah. yeah. Going forth. That that yes, what a gift. Yeah. Well, I think it's really powerful and I just love that you brought it up. I didn't really know what it was until you articulated it, uh, which is what, which is what you do. But it is, I, I really think that it's so important because I think it, I've never heard anybody ever talk about it um, other than you and other than Linda mention it to me. And I never would have seen it had it not been pointed out. And I think when you, um, because had I done that, which I obviously do now in my, in my presentation, it's a whole nother level. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, so going back to this, making the leap. So, you know, you get on a plane, you, you go to New York, but mm -hmm. certainly you didn't just go from artist to business person. Was it oh. immediately easy for you to see how to make that transition? And what did it, did it seem like what people do in the theater is exactly what they should do in business? How did that leap happen? I thought, arrogantly <laughs> I was going to I was like this is going to be great I've been working with groups for decades I know what it is to run a team I thought a cast would be similar to a team I thought lots of similarities which weren't as similar I mean there are some things but there are so many things that were not as similar so no super bumpy and then I read some wrong some books that were less than helpful and uh I was thinking that we have a team, it's going to be like a cast, and it's not. Because when you have a team, you're together forever. Casts come together with that gorgeous energy of a, even though some shows go on the road forever, yeah. there's the sense of we're a family, we're together. <laughs> and um, I, I hadn't realized how different it would be to have a team working together in business. And I, I read a book that resonated with me that said, make your team your family. And uh, yeah, that was a mistake. So that was, I was like, oh, it, and I wanted it. I wanted that to be true because that read, and then I'm like, that is, yeah, don't do that. Don't, there are a lot, I can tell you, I feel like I could tell you all the things not to do. Here's one of the big ones that I had to learn really um, the hard way. We are serving, when we're theater, we're serving the performance. And I'm a teaching artist. So I've been teaching for a long time and my focus is, is on the individual, which is why I can be a great coach, right? Yeah. I brought that energy as an artist to a business. And so I was all about keeping a team and coaching that I could coach every member of the team to be, you know, I'd hire people and coach them to be, to work out great. And who I neglected was articulate, the business, mm -hmm. who I let down was the company because, and that also meant I let down the people who were actually good fits for the company. Yeah. And it translates back to a show as well, right? That if we're, does, is that the right person to be cast in that role? Mm -hmm. So here's my short way of saying it. As a coach, I needed to learn to be a leader. And so many leaders are being taught to be coaches. Yeah. What we want to make sure is that you know the angle you're coming from. So no one said to me, I thought I got this down. I'm a coach. I'm going to be the best leader ever. And it, I was poopy. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I had a lot to learn and I keep learning. So, and as an artist, I think the thing we do bring is heart and emotion. So if we get back to that question you had brought in a little bit earlier, that artist sense and why you think salespeople need to be thinking about that, I think, is that we live and swim and believe in bringing about emotion and voice and that sense of um, who we are in the moment. And I've often said to actors, you are breathing for an audience that's holding their breath. Nice. And we are doing the same thing as artists going into the corporate world. We are having people get back to their breath and their individuality. So I am with you in that corporate America, I think, kind of pushed that aside and got in the sense of being more efficient, tried to make everybody the same and got in dotting, you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's. And I think that coming back to that individuality is super important and hard and messy. And communication is ridiculously messy. And I think that's also why corporate and, and business world were like, we need it to fit in a box. But the problem is, Meredith, you and I are similar white women who work in the speaking and communication world. And we are incredibly different. So if we're so similar and so different in what you say and how I say it and how I use my hands and the words that I choose, if it's that different on the two of us who are similar, think about the delightful diversity of who we are in the working world, right? And all the packages we come in, that's why communication is hard because I can try and, exact, and do exactly what you did, Meredith. And we're like, oh, that does not work. And I don't mean that it's <laughs> fake. I mean that it just doesn't work for me. It, that, that doesn't, yeah. those genes don't work for me. That's not my style. Different sneakers, different. Yeah. yeah. So, so true because I think it, you know, which is another area of your expertise is that authenticity is, is so important. We are really just about at the end of this show, okay. but I'm going to keep you just, I'm going to keep you just a little bit longer because I really want to address Tani's subject here. Yeah. Um, and that is, it's hard to stay focused yes. and not let my brain get ahead of myself. What do you tell uh, the business people or even the artists that you work with? Yep. How do you stay focused? Yep. Three things come to mind. One very specific tool to stay present in the moment is borrowed from the stage. It's going to sound really weird. <laughs> you want to inhale <laughs> the person to whom you're speaking, even virtually right now or the group. I don't mean sniff them. Right. I don't mean that. <laughs> I mean that idea of inhaling them. When we inhale, it takes a moment and brings us back to the present. So on stage, the way we use it when we're training actors, if they are in the eighth show of the week, even if they're in Hamilton, <laughs> they might yeah. be in a scene and they might have gone, gone away a little bit and said, oh my goodness, I really need to remember to get half and half on the way home from the theater, right? They may have left and gone into their head, right? That happens when we're in conversations where we are thinking ahead, to Tony's point, to the next thing we're going to say. And one way to get back is to inhale and come back to the moment. Mm -hmm. The other is to recognize that you can say exactly that. We, the transparency is super important. My head, I just went ahead. I missed what you just said. That transparency of being truthful and in the moment, my head went three places, that builds trust and connection. That transparency is huge. That idea of the breathing in the other person and connected to the breath is the exhale. So most of us are holding our breath. Some of you listening right now, Meredith, you right now might be holding your breath yeah. without even really it. And we hold our breath. The problem physiologically is when we hold our breath, we don't get oxygen in our bloodstream. So oxygen doesn't go to our brain to help us think. So when mm -hmm. we say we're losing our thoughts, we, we really, really are losing are. our thoughts. <laughs> yeah. So if we can, when we're going ahead, exhale, you just don't want to probably do this like, like in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> but we do give people words like, oh, uh-huh, hold on. We give them language. Voice rides on the exhale. So if you have a word that you can say that gets your exhale going again, then our air comes back in. We are a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So if we exhale, it's why in athletics, we're taught like as a runner, I was a runner, to exhale. We're not taught to go, right? And just so you know, another little aside on that, so you know, is if you're irritated, you tend to exhale. You don't go, 
All right. So yeah. more power to the exhale, which gets us back on our breath, which gets oxygen back in our stream, our bloodstream, because we get back, the vacuum is working again. <sighs> then the air comes back in. So the idea of inhaling to be in the moment to really pay attention to the other person, the idea of being transparent. Hmm. I left for a moment. I'm back. You had me thinking about something. And the third one of to get back so your breath you're breathing again because we're often holding our breath i don't know yeah. tawny if those help oh i if think they're... um tawny i think she just gave you brilliant um advice years ago i'm going to use all of those years ago i had uh marcia reynolds tell me or i'd written an article that marcia reynolds who's a oh, yeah. very successful yeah. coach had written yeah and she said um if you can stay present um you it, it the right answers, the right things will come up out of your gut. You'll almost yes. start talking through your inside rather than you know, your gut versus your brain. And when I do that, now I'm going to use these exercises now to do that. I'm kind of like, sometimes something will come out of my mouth and I'll be like, who was that? That was brilliant. I mean, it never would have come out of my head. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk you know, I think good. I went way more woo woo. I love her <laughs> idea. I love that. I always, always said, if I'm present in the moment, Teachers from the universe give me thoughts. <laughs> they help me out because I don't always have the answer. I have yeah. to say, when I was teaching, I did a lot of work with um, middle school students in after school programs with theater. And I got a lot of kids who were going through a lot of things. And I, I'm like, I never knew what to say. <laughs> I translate this directly to my corporate world. And when I would just breathe and be in the moment, I, it, I didn't think of it the way you just said. I love that. I always thought, Somebody just gave me the words that this kid needed to hear, and I'm going to translate. Your audience needs it. Your coworker. Oh, I love that, Meredith. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yep. Well, and I think um, what I think you've layered on here, and Tony says excellent advice, is that it's the exercises to do it. Keeping yeah. yourself present, I think, is one of the hardest things <laughs> to do, but boy, people feel it. Yes. And when they feel it, and then again, you have all this wisdom and all this experience and it'll all just bubble up out of you. Actually, your brain's going to mess it up a little bit. Yeah. You know? Can I, one last thing for the sure. presence element that I want to make sure is that we have come to say that presence is a verb, meaning that it comes and goes and you lose it. It's not a checkbox on a 360 or a quarterly review. And the reason we say that is it's like balance. Minute, yeah. nuanced things to adjust in order to stay balanced are the same with presence. So if you find yourself disappearing for a moment, going into the files in your brain to answer something, and you've, you're not present anymore, no beating up of self. You simply want to go, oh, I'm back now. So thinking about it, you fall off the balance beam. You fall off the slack line. You lose your balance once in a while. Same with presence. You will, you will lose that presence once in a while and just know you can come back without having to get upset in any way. Nuance back, exhale, come back to that relationship and be there for the other person. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I feel like we've just scratched the surface. So you have to, you have to come back and, um, and uh, bring your COVID puppy with you. Uh, <laughs> bring your COVID bring puppy with you. Because I'm surprised mine didn't walk back here. I used oh, to stop yeah. him from coming in the studio, but I love him so much. It makes me happy to see him back there. But um, tell our audience how they, I mean, they, really find out more. I was yeah. all over your website last night. You do so many amazing things. And I really believe you look at this subject in a variety of ways, but in a depth that I don't see that uh, that often. And again, I just really believe when it comes to an uncertain marketplace, the one gift you can give people is clear communication. Oh, it, 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 it solves so much. So how do they find you? How do they find out about your business and all that you do? Great. So please, uh, we have our website. So it's articulatrc.com. And the RC stands for real and clear. So articulatrc.com. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I love to have conversations there and then connect you. Down at the bottom, I don't know if they can see the screen, but we have, you can also email us, office yes. at articulatrc.com. And our phone number, call us. We like to chat. We like to communicate. Really find us. And I, I'm, I find communication hard. <laughs> so I am, I am like, I am behind you to figure out how to make it more efficient, easier, more effective. I'm on this journey with you. I would love to have a conversation with you and guide you, you and teams that we work with teams a lot. 
We do yeah. a lot of work with teams and communication. Well, we'll make sure that all of that gets into the um, into the show notes. And Great. I personally believe that communication is probably the best investment an organization can make yes. in its <laughs> leaders and its teams. I do because yeah, if you can communicate, you can solve so many issues and so many problems. I can't tell you how many times I walk into an organization. And when you get down to it, the problem, the one thing holding them back is their inability to understand, connect, and communicate with one another. Yes. And that's why leadership teams, that's why we have, like, instead of working with each, and we do do, of course, one-on-one -on -one with yeah. leaders and that kind of thing. But then I see a, working with the whole team on their communication, powerful, right? Powerful. Super powerful. Yeah. Well yeah. said, Meredith. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much for joining us today. Loved how active the audience was. That's a big uh, testament to you, Hillary. Uh, you. We're going to wrap you. this up, put it in a podcast, and we'll see you right back here next week, one o'clock Eastern for another episode of Thriving in Uncertainty, because we want to shift how you think, change, and act and feel towards uncertainty and put you in a position of control.